Hi, I'm John Nunn, and in this video I'm going to talk about a recent book from Gambit Publications, Win with the Karo Khan. The authors are two Norwegians, Severe Johnson and Torbjorn Ringdahl Hansen, and in 240 pages of quite detailed analysis, they are demonstrating a complete repertoire against 1e4. All lines against the Karo Khan are considered, even some of White's less common alternatives. The structure of the book is that it's divided into 30 lessons and each lesson starts with a summary of that particular variation followed by a model game and then what they call a theory magnifier which is a section of more detailed analysis. I'd just like to show one game, one of the model games from um, the book and if we just go to the start of the game, it's coming against one of the authors, Hansen, London 2017, and it shows one of their recommendations against the main line for white. Of course, it doesn't matter whether white plays knight c3 or knight d2 or move two, you end up, move three rather, you end up with the same position. Well, here they provide detailed analysis of two different possibilities for black. First of all, the fairly conventional move bishop f5 and secondly and that's the one I'm going to talk about today it's knight f6 it's a move which has been played by amongst others Korchnoi and by several contemporary grandmasters white generally exchanges and according to the sort of traditional wisdom this exchange can only favour white because white now has a queenside majority, so in an endgame the majority can create a passed pawn, whereas black's majority on the king's side, which includes a double pawn, cannot create a passed pawn. And unlike, for example, the exchange variation of the Rido Pez, black doesn't even have the two bishops to compensate for this damage to his pawn structure, because of course white also has the two bishops. Nevertheless, that's a kind of superficial assessment. This theoretical advantage only really applies in the endgame, and the endgame in this position is a long way off. Black has gained a certain advantage by the capture on f6. It solidifies his king side, and it enables him to develop his bishop on f8 without loss of time. Well, one of the critical lines for white, which is why this variation was under a cloud for several years, involves white developing very aggressively and now the queen comes to c2 and the queen and bishop line up is attacking the pawn on h7. Well if you uh, had to play a move for black here and you'd never seen the position before I suppose you would consider playing g6 or h6 or if you were feeling really creative you might play king h8 so as to trap the bishop after bishop takes h7 g6. Well all of these moves have a certain defect. The problem with g6 is that a plan for white involving h4 and queenside castling gives white a dangerous attack. h6 is of course possible but the problem here is that white's knight in many lines goes to g3 and then to f5 and having a pawn on h6 doesn't really help to prevent that. Black would really prefer to have the pawn g6 rather than h6, but as I said, this tends to allow an attack by white. So in this book, the authors recommend the slightly odd-looking move h5. This is not the first move you would think of in this position, but in many pages of analysis, they make a convincing case that this is really black's best move. And if you look in a big database, you'll find that in fact this move has scored better for black than any of the other major alternatives in this position. White has a big choice here, whether he's going to castle kingside or queenside. Kingside is solid. In some lines, black even pushes his pawn to h4 to prevent white's knight going to h3. And although white doesn't take much risk by castling kingside, it's also quite difficult to prove any kind of advantage. So I'd like to look at the more critical plan of casting queenside. 
to see how black counters this direct um, development by white. Knight comes out, castles. Uh, Black's kingside is looking a little bare of minor pieces here. So the normal move for black is to drop the knight back to f8, which of course clears the way for the development of the bishop on c8. And also the knight, well, okay, it didn't have very many alternative squares, but the knight is quite useful here um, to fend off any threats white might develop on the king side. So let's play a few more normal moves. Bishop coming to e6 is a typical idea. Black is aiming for a direct attack on the queen side, possibly queen coming to a5, and possibly pushing the b-pawn. White, of course, can develop some play on the king side, but actually it's not so easy, thanks to the move h5, which makes it difficult for white to develop his king, or push forward his kingside pawns and get a genuine attack going. White here plays a normal move c4, blocking off a, an attack on a2, giving the white knight a square on c3, and potentially enabling a push in the centre with d5. Over the next few moves, the battle focuses on whether or not black can play b5, undermining white's um, pawn duo in the centre of the board. At the moment, black can't play b5, the pawn is hanging, and black plays the slightly mysterious rook c8, which does, however, put the rook opposite the white queen, and therefore does threaten to play the advanced b5. White counters this by continuing with his plan, putting his knight on c3, and incidentally preventing once again the move b5 by blocking the rook's potential attack on the white queen. This is a, an interesting move. Again, perhaps not the first move you would think of, but it's an effective one. Black actually renews the threat of playing b5 by playing this, because there's an exchange on c3 then, which would either draw the white queen to c3, where it can be attacked by the rook on c8, or if white retakes on c3 with the pawn, then there's a potential opening of the b-file, and also white's king becomes somewhat exposed. This threat is actually quite serious, so white plays his knight forward to avoid the exchange. Now there's a danger of the bishop being cut off with c5, so the bishop drops back to e7. Now of course white could put his knight back on c3 now, but actually black doesn't have to agree to a draw by playing bishop b4. The bishop is actually not badly placed on e7, and black could continue with queen a5, again with toying with the idea of b5. So white doesn't necessarily get a draw even here. And what White actually played was he simply developed his last remaining piece and put his rook in the centre of the board. Black gets his b5 moving finally because of the opposition of rook and queen. This does not lose a pawn. And White now played c5. A committal move, and probably not the best, um, creates a backward d-pawn, opens up the diagonal for the bishop, pointing to a2. So white would probably have actually done better, for example, to play knight c5 instead, aiming for exchanges. But the position then would be about equal, and white was probably aiming for more. But c5 is a risky move. In fact, black made a, an error here. From the point of view of the evaluation of the opening, we need only note that black should have played g6. And the reason for this move is that white had a kind of threat to play his knight back to c3, and then black, for example, plays his queen to a5, and white plays f4, intending to kick the bishop away by pushing the pawn to f5. The reason why g6 was a good move was that now black can simply block the advance of the white f-pawn. The defence by the pawn on g6 is necessary, because otherwise white could simply take on f5. And in fact, white's move f4 has, in this position, only succeeded in blocking in the bishop on e3. And now white has to face the awkward threat of b4, because a2 is hanging. So actually, playing g6 would have given black a fine position, 
and the computer indeed evaluates it as uh, fractionally better for black already. So black could be happy with the outcome of the opening. The move he actually played was less accurate. He chased the white knight around, but now he has to deal with the fact that white's threatening the pawn on f5, and in addition he's given white the square c4 for the bishop. So here I would say that thanks to the inaccuracy, white has a slight advantage. But it's easy for white to go wrong. Black played for the exchange of bishops to weaken the d4 pawn, and white took, and g pawn is attacked, so push forward, also enabling knight to come to f4, and black started to play on the queen side, getting ready to push the pawn to b3, and in this position indeed that is a threat which would win material. Well white kind of lost the thread of the game here, he should have just put his bishop on c4, aiming for further exchanges with possibly a marginal edge for white, but nothing very much. But it only took one inaccuracy from white before he ran into trouble. He chose to counter black's threat of pushing the b-pawn by playing his queen to a4, attacking the pawns on c6 and a7, but he probably overlooked the strength of this reply. Black drops his queen back, indirectly defending the pawn on c6 because of bishop takes a2 check winning the queen and it would be suicidal also for white to take the other pawn because of the skewer leading to a2 so actually the queen on playing the queen to a4 only really served to decentralize the queen and now black has a fine position white compounded his error by preventing the queen's retreat and also weakening the dark squares now black has an excellent position, large advantage. Bishop comes to d5, clearing the way for the knight to come to e6 and the bishop to go to f3 with the aim of simply winning the pawn on d4. Well, white thought he might as well have a pawn for his pains, but it's a winning position for black. Black's initiative is simply too strong. His pieces are all well centralised and the white queen is vulnerable and exposed at the edge of the board. And it took only a few moves before black came in, playing to win the pawn on d4. Now black gained some time by chasing the white queen around, before finally grabbing the pawn. And now there's a big problem because the knight can come to b5 and then to a3 with mate or to c3 with check. So it's all crumbling. White played the rather desperate rook e3 and Black actually found a neat way to win material here. He played his rook to d8. The white queen can't go to c5, uh, to c7 because of knight b5 and knight a3 mate. So the queen has only one other square to e7. And now the simple capture on c2 wins material. If white takes with the king, rook comes to a2. If white takes with the rook, then rook d1 check gives Black a decisive attack. And finally, if queen takes f6, the Intermediate move knight a3 check wins a piece. So white resigned. Well, it was an interesting game, and it shows that the plan of playing h5 actually works rather well against casting queenside. And you can see that white never got any attack going on the king side at all. It only took a few moves once black was able to get in this critical move b5 uh, to generate serious threats on the queen side. In this case, the double pawns on the king side didn't really matter at all. In fact, the f pawns were a useful um, line of defence against white's uh, pressure along the b1 to h7 diagonal. Well, there were quite a few interesting ideas like this in the book, and uh, a lot of comprehensive analysis of, of all the possibilities um, in the Karo Khan. As I say, they also analysed bishop f5 as well as knight f6. So you have a, a choice of lines against the, the main white continuation. Of course there are many opening books but I think the approach taken by these authors in reviving and um, showing the dynamic possibilities of some perhaps lesser known lines makes this a really worthwhile opening book. Okay thank you for listening to the Caro Khan video and I hope to see you again for our next Gambit video.